Welcome, Christine. Hey, thanks for having me. Christine, how are you? Is everything well? Have you been going through this? Uh, everything's well. I mean, I'm probably in the same position everyone else is in, which is it feels like Groundhog Day every day, um, but you power through. That is pretty much the game. So why don't you give the origin story, Christine, uh, for everybody for context, because we want to make sure a lot of people become aware of this incredible business. Yeah, so um, I have always done, since for the past 20 years, um, always done B2B technologies, um, very industry agnostic. So I was in online advertising for a while, large file sharing for a while, uh, ERP reporting, um, and then into apparel, right? So it's not exactly that there's a thread. I don't come to this from the retail space. But when we were starting, we um, were looking for a really big idea in a really big industry that had not yet been disrupted by data and technology. Um, and after looking at, you know, travel and healthcare and energy, we settled in on apparel pretty quickly, largely because it never bounced back after um, the Great Recession. Um, and all of the profit went away. So 97% of the profit is made by just 20 companies in this space. Um, and it's a pretty old school industry. And that says, you know, uh, it's huge. It was two and a half trillion um, a year before uh, COVID hit. Um, but that says there's actually a real opportunity to go in and do something disruptive. Um, so we came together, a group of us came together, um, had a thesis on why all the profit went away, um, which was inventory risk. Um, uh, you know, consumers buy relatively conservatively. Um, they tend to buy basics and staples, yet manufacturers have to make continual newness and prints and on-trend items. And that just creates a massive imbalance. And then you get this like ridiculous markdown cycle that happens. And so um, as we kind of uh, came to the obvious point that everyone comes to, I wouldn't say that was our big insight. Um, we figured the way that you could actually go about solving this was by figuring out how to monetize the tail um, and really take a page out of Netflix's book and say, instead of just focusing on blockbusters um, and hot item that everybody wants, it's really about monetizing this very large catalog. And that's when we came up with this access model um, where consumers would sign up for a monthly subscription um, and be able to get unlimited access to uh, uh, inventory and styles and items that they would not normally buy and commit to owning permanently. And that's where Clothing as a Service was born. I love that. I love that. And, and how was the, you know, when you're doing that kind of innovating, Christine, how, how was that received in the first... 30, 40, 60 convo. <laughs> I love your face. You know, even with this hundredth of a second delay, you know, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, this is, you know, I'm laughing because there's a little bit of a selfishness here. My whole, every single thing I basically double clicked into was met with enormous cynicism, starting with an e-commerce site in 1996, ending with a couple of years ago when I tried to convince everybody to get into sports cards. Uh, and uh, most of them have worked out for me and I, I'm enjoying this question because I'm curious how those first 30 combos went. And just to show all the entrepreneurs out there, as it's gained traction, how have some of those combos been revisional history or a little bit fun? Like, paint us a couple pictures here. Yeah, so I think um, one of the things uh, that I've done, and especially when you're bringing up a new monetization model with entrenched players who have a uh, reason to not want to innovate. It's, um, I've been through this before. So in 2004, I was the president and COO of a company called Right Media, um, where we created and pioneered the first advertising exchange. Um, very different way that online ads were bought and sold. And so I've been through this before. And I think then um, I was a little bit of a deer in headlights trying to figure out, well, how do you get these large incumbent players to change their mindset and really think three years out instead of you know, the next month out? So going into this, I brought a lot of that experience um, with me and knew that there were a couple of things um, that you do when you're trying to bring on significant um, category creation. One, you never go to the people who are winning first, right? So the people who are the most incented to keep things the way that they are are actually the people that are winning. In online advertising, we didn't touch ad.com. Um, they they had, uh, you know, they were the biggest and baddest ad network out there. They were the most incented to keep it the way that it was. Here, we didn't go after Zara, right? We didn't go after Nordstrom. You don't go after the companies who are crushing it in the current economy. Instead, you look at 
um, who is actually positioned to take a risk. Um, and so you look for companies that are maybe dis more disadvantaged or maybe they moved a little bit more slowly into the new way things were happening. Um, you go there first and you end up getting a lot more receptivity when you can have an open conversation around the reality um, of, the, uh, of the economy that they're playing in and they're in fact not winning. And that's counterintuitive, right? Because most people want to go, you know, let me get the 800 pound gorilla first. Um, that is a mistake in the beginning, especially when you're not 100% sure how it's going to work out. You want to go after clients who are more willing to, willing to innovate with you. Christine, you sit at an interesting spot, uh, both as a digital only entrepreneur and a service provider to some old school retailers. What are you seeing specifically around on the front from the front lines, especially around e-commerce, what they're doing online, what they're doing in retail? How are they innovating? What are you seeing? Look, I think, you know, uh, the end of March hit and suddenly brands that had been who were responsible for billions and billions and billions of dollars of revenue. Um, but 80% of that comes from brick and mortar. Um, went to become it, went from thinking about, yeah, e comms a good channel and it's growing slowly year over year to now I'm a digital only mm -hmm. um, uh, operation. And one, they were trying to scramble with your basics first, which is, oh God, we have all this inventory. How do we move it? Because 80% of it was going into stores. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, and they did a couple of things initially, which are kind of your standard things that you do when you're in a crunch. You go after your most loyal consumers first. So the only people they could really tap into to move inventory were people who have been buying from them forever. Um, that is a resource that you can deplete really quickly. And so what you see through April and May, which was these massive increases in their e-com sales, followed over the June and July of fatigue, where people have, you know, they've spent what they're going to spend on 75% off, off sales. Mm -hmm. um, and now you've retrained them to be uh, bargain shoppers, which of course everybody's going to be in an economic decline. Um, but you've really kind of devalued your product. And now you're sitting there saying, well, we've hit everybody we could hit. They've spent what they could spend. So now what? And when we talk with our brands today, the conversation is really around, you need to figure out for the first time, and you're being forced to do this, but for the first time ever, how to be a digitally first company, you have to figure out how to acquire people into your brand first online. And that is not the way that they have historically thought. The only people who buy from a brick and mortar retailer online are the people who shopped in store before. Nobody stumbles upon um, uh, you know, Express or Loft for the first time online, right? They've been converted from one channel to another. And so now you're talking about these brands trying to figure out how do we actually acquire with a direct response mindset? That is not a mindset that a lot of the marketing departments have. And so they've been really interesting conversations on figuring out how we can help them think about um, being digitally native and digital only brands. Do you, do you feel that brands, when they think about that funnel, think too much about, oh, that's like conversion and, and like lower funnel and sales and don't realize how much brand work can be done in those funnels, Christine? I think it's actually, they go after the metric potentially too hard at first, right? So if yep. you think about, a lot of these guys are very large public companies um, and they're held to the standards of the street, right? And so they usually do their marketing budgets as a percent of sales. Digital only, and I, you know, you had Warby on earlier, and a lot of the, and Bombas on earlier, a lot of these digital only um, or digital first companies on, they don't think about marketing that way, right? Really? Marketing is an investment today in revenue well into the future. And maybe Correct. that future is three months, most likely that future is 12 to 18 months out. That is not the way your traditional brick and mortar companies think about marketing. They think about, I'm gonna throw three to Conversion. five. Conversion, yeah. Yeah, and so if they're not seeing the immediate response that's driving profitability, they tend to pull back. It's, it's, it's as if they don't even recognize the existence of LTV. They don't measure it well, but I don't think that that's because they don't, um, they understand it exists. I don't think they've had models in the past that produce favorable LTV models over the long haul. Understood. Um, and so when you're looking at the numbers and you're saying, look, I'm investing in Facebook, I'm investing in Instagram, and I'm not seeing a payoff today, 
Also, I don't have the whole funnel figured out, so I'm definitely not seeing a payoff in 12 months. Why am I going to continue to invest in this? And I think our work with them, because we do a lot of marketing strategy work with them, is really around that customer journey um, and figuring out how to get people into inherently profitable purchase funnels to begin with so that um, your payback on your CAC, on your uh, customer acquisition cost, is uh, very fast, and it's producing outsized LTV uh, returns. Zubin, wrap us up here. Christine, what's some Give us a question. Yeah, Christine, what are some predictions you have in terms of the different types of retailers, brands that you work with? What are the ones that are going to look look back and say, this was a successful period for us, we pivoted appropriately? What are those behaviors look like versus the ones that aren't going to? I think the first thing is there are definitely some brands out there that have rose-colored glasses on. And they believe there's going to be this massive V-shaped recovery and stores are going to uh, go back to the level that they were. I believe in, in stores, right? I believe in stores are really important channels, an important marketing channel, it's an important acquisition channel, and it's an important um, monetization channel. However, you have to have right-sized your various departments to um, understand reality, which is a massive amount moved online because it had to. Most of that is going to stay online. And so therefore, those store footprints have to be right-sized. Your merch teams have to be right-sized. Your marketing teams have to be right-sized in order to deal with the new reality. And there are definitely two schools of thought. There are people who are planning for um, very slow uh, buildback of various channels and consumer behavior. And then there are other companies that are uh, just thinking this thing's gonna bounce back. As soon as you know X happens, why recovery is there. And I think that is way too, ro they have to plan much more for the downside and the people who do will come out of it in a much stronger position. So I think uh, accepting reality um, uh, is, the, uh, is the first step to being able to make the right moves. And there aren't enough companies accepting reality right now. Yeah, I think what's interesting is that we're talking about ex ex uh, accepting reality during a pandemic, whereas we collectively know that this reality should have been accepted two, three, four, five years ago in terms of the changes, the pivots they need to make, the right sizing, as you mentioned. Um, for those that are listening that have uh, smaller brands or they're launching right now, what's some advice you have for them in terms of uh, kind of go-to-market strategies at this point? Look, I think obviously everything being built from a digitally first place, I still think wholesale has a big role to play for small emerging brands because it gets you that distribution, but that can't be a channel that you rely on long-term. It's nice to have upfront orders. It's nice to be able to factor receivables. That's super important from an economic standpoint, but you need a way to then drive people directly to your own site. So I do think it is like, you know, we hear all the time, omni, omni, omni. So you can be using various channels in order to gain awareness and look at those wholesale opportunities um, as really marketing opportunities, but you've got to have an engine behind it that can sweep up and own the relationship with the consumer directly. Brilliant. Love it. Thank you so much for your time and continued success. I, I really admire the, the innovation. Thanks. Thanks so much. This was great.